Just so you know. Hey everyone, we're just going to give it a couple minutes before Tom starts his um, intro. So just stay tuned and we will be back shortly. September uh, program for the Redlands Area Historical Society. Uh, we had a potluck, which had a lot of luck. Uh, actually brought home enchiladas, and that's the first time in a long time that Nancy's been able to do that. And then um, Kathleen Beal took everybody on a walking tour of the lawn bowling club, and then had people come back if they were interested on Saturday and we had two of our members join the lawn bowling club. So it's nice that we're supporting them and they're supporting us. Uh, tonight's program I'm really looking forward to because even though I've indexed the facts and the citrograph, I found exactly two citations on the Koreans in Redlands for all the years of the facts and the Redlands review. So to say that the Koreans were not mentioned is without truth. Um, two citations. Now I found plenty of Chinese and even uh, uh, Japanese. The Japanese, of course, were busy uh, working for Southern California Edison, building the infrastructure for the high line that came from Forest Home to the power drop for powerhouse number two and three in Mill Creek Canyon. And uh, the Japanese even had a camp up on Yukaipa Ridge while they were building that uh, infrastructure, tunnels and pipes that were going in and all that kind of work. Um, the Koreans lived, of course, on Oriental Street to some degree. The Japanese did not. They were uh, on East State and near Redlands Boulevard, almost where Kuka is. In fact, later on, you find the Japanese have a uh, have a fresh fruit stand right where Kuka's is, and we're selling fresh fruit until World War II came along. And they moved to Arizona to avoid being shipped off to internment camps. So I look at uh, tonight's presentation as kind of filling in one of those gaps on Redlands history in terms of the Korean occupation here that we have not ever discussed. And as I said, in my research, I didn't find diddly squat, okay? Um, let's see, what else could I need to tell you? Next month's meeting, uh, a month from today, practically, we are going to be talking about ghosts along the Mill Creek Sankey, or Zonha, which is correct. And uh, Maria Reynolds will be doing that presentation. And then October 22nd at, at uh, 4 p.m., uh, myself and Ron and uh, J.P. Beal and Kathleen Beal are going to present our 13th annual walking tour of Hillside Cemetery at four o'clock, beginning at the old mausoleum, the Egyptian mausoleum, which is right up on the uh, south end of the cemetery near the office. Okay, it's ten dollars for members and. Uh, $15 for non-members. I was almost going to say $25, but I, I didn't. I didn't. Okay. So um, um, summer was officially over three or four days ago, and somehow no one's contacted Mother Nature to let her know that summer is over. Uh, this is one summer I won't miss. Won't, won't, won't miss. And that's with uh, 12 solar panels on the roof. But when you have to run the air conditioning at night because it's 81 degrees outside at 3 a.m. 
to say it's inconvenient is, you know, not stretching the truth by any, by any test. Let's see. I have some other announcements here that I've got to scroll through my phone. If you're interested in San Bernardino history, uh, on October 6th, the San Bernardino Historical Society is going to talk about the history of Norton Air, Air Base, which is now quickly becoming a transportation hub. Uh, we listen to the planes come over our house as they're going in for landings because they've got to land facing the west because they need the incoming breeze. Uh, they can't be, have a tailwind. They've got to have a the wind coming from the front. So that puts them right over our house. Um, Larry Burgess, Nathan Gonzalez, and I are still presenting our night class on history of Redlands. It's already started on Tuesday nights. If you're interested in signing up, you can do that at the front desk at Smiley Library. It's $30 per person. There are six sessions and Larry does two, Nathan does two, and I do two so that you're not totally asphyxiated by any one of us as the time goes on. The old house group, which we should probably change the name because we're gonna be doing more than just old houses. We're gonna be doing churches and University of Redlands, uh, administration building, the, uh, the chapel at the U of R, uh, churches that are mid-century modern in downtown Redlands. And this coming October 8th, 19th at 6 30 p.m. we're going to be doing we're going to have a tour of 215 East Redlands Boulevard which is an Indian motorcycle house clubhouse and uh, building today so 215 it'll be in the newsletter uh, with more information on it uh, let's see I already told you about the October meeting oh um, Christmas party It'll be interesting this coming year. Christmas party, we're going to be at the Estancia, not the Asistencia, because that doesn't exist, but the Asistencia. And we're going to have our Christmas party there. And we're going to have a taco truck pull up on Barton Road. And we'll have tables and chairs. And we'll eat in the uh, green area. And if you've not been to the Estancia, it's your chance to get to see it up close and personal since the uh, Redlands Conservancy now as uh, the patron of the facility. March, Historical Society meeting. I know you're wondering what's gonna happen in March. We're gonna have the great flood of 1938 because it was March 3rd of 1938. So what a fitting thing to have in March. February, you're going to have to endure me. I'm gonna give the second half of the of the uh, presentation I did on before and after, showing you homes when they're first built, what they look like, and then showing them later on after extensive changes. You're gonna be shocked as we get on Palm Avenue as go one right after the other. And none of them look like what they did when they were first built. Uh, they went from Victorian to classic boxes and so on. So it's kind of interesting. And then April, uh, John Paul Beale is going to give uh, Redlands during the Gilded Age, which should be something about the rich and famous of Redlands that lived here that really put us on the social calendar map for that time period. So um, hopefully everybody at home was able to hear me uh, because I started before they were on the internet and they have told us on social internet, they've really given the messages to Aaron, which is just fine. And they're angry that they didn't get to hear my spiel, which is okay by me, but not okay by Aaron, and not okay <laughs> by the people that are on uh, the social media. So we're on Zoom tonight. So you're gonna see the, you're gonna see the um, laptop go up here to the podium. And then when you ask your question, give the speaker a little time to repeat the question because the people on Zoom can't hear you back there to know what the question is that the speaker is answering. So without further ado, here is Ron Running, who has spent most of the summer traveling all over the world. And he's going to uh, introduce our speaker.
Okay, welcome to everybody for the start of our uh, new year and um, welcome to the people on Zoom. Uh, before uh, I begin my introduction of our speaker, uh, one further announcement, we are developing a training program for docents that will lead tours. And our first tour project will be a downtown tour. So Judith Hunt, if you raise your hand, um, is going to be training the um, docents. And so she's got some volunteers, but we need a lot more. So uh, contact her if you're interested. Professor Chang is our speaker tonight, and he is the professor of ethnic studies at uh, U of R. I mean, excuse me, Cal uh, University of California at Riverside. Uh, he is the director, founding director of the Yang O Kim Center of Korean American Studies there. He's um, published 12 books, and his latest book is this one, um, The Chapa Camp. And uh, he was awarded the grand prize from the Association of Studies of Koreans Abroad for that book. It was featured in the New York Times, LA Times, NBC News and PBS NewsHour. So we're very fortunate to have him uh, here tonight. He also published Korean Americans a Concise History in 2019. He was the leading expert on the Los Angeles civil unrest and appeared in CNN special report um, after uh, in 2022. So at this time, I'd like to turn the time over to Professor Chen. So if you could stay close-ish to the computer so that people at home can hear. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me, Ron and Don, uh, Wetlands Area Historical Society. And the Pachapa Camp, uh, what is known as the Pachapa Camp, is also known as Dosan's Republic. And when I began my research project around 2016, 2017, I really didn't understand the meaning of Dosan's Republic. Why did they call it Republic? I mean, a small you know, village in downtown Riverside. But now I know what it meant. Uh, Dosan is a pen name for the An Chang Ho, who was a leader of the Pachapa camp. And he's like a Thomas Jefferson of Republic of Korea. He's very well known, very famous. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, organizations named after him, studying about him, but none of it mentioned anything about Pachapak and Riverside. All of his writing focuses on either San Francisco or Los Angeles or elsewhere but not, not Riverside. So uh, I'm going to be giving you historical background of how and why, uh, and it's a historical importance of it. It's not moving. So maybe I need to down. It's not moving. <laughs> Anyway, I have been, it's not working, but maybe I, I Is it working now? No. Yeah, it's working now. Yes. I don't know what we're viewing. 
Anyway, I, you know, I have been giving a lot of lectures on the Pachapa camp and Korean American history. And I tell my students that unless people know their history, their identity is anchored. So this is what I believe in. And I emphasize many of young students to learn about their own history or someone else's history. By the way, uh, the Pachapa camp uh, was designated by the city of Riverside in March 2017 as point of cultural interest. Uh, as of now, there's nothing left. Uh, it's owned and operated by Southern California Gas Company, fueling station, uh, unfortunately, but at, at least I was able to bring history alive that that, that was a site of the first Korean community in the entire United States. Now it's not working. Oh yeah, they're working. Uh, if you go to downtown Riverside, uh, some of you may have visited uh, downtown Riverside, there is a Martin Luther King statue right next to it, uh, such as Chavez, and across the University Avenue, you will see this man, An Chang Ho, who was a leader of Korean community. And for, if you go further back, uh, you will see uh, Mahatma Gandhi statue. So it's known as a civil rights walk. So if you have a chance to visit downtown Riverside, you will be able to see those statues standing tall. And this is one of the most significant uh, photographs of An Chang Hong, the man who led by example. He was a leader of the commun uh, community, but he worked side by side with his fellow countrymen picking oranges and uh, that's, that's him. And I was able, based on my book that I wrote, uh, I, I, we did, I decided to do a tour, I mean, exhibition in downtown Riverside, uh, Barbara uh, Culver Center. And this exhibition was a small exhibition, but uh, you know, like Ron uh, said earlier, received the wide media attention, LA Times, New York Times, PBS News Hour, uh, did a six and a half minute story of it, which is remarkable. I mean, News Hour to do that long uh, about this man and the Chapa camp. So it garnered uh, the second highest major media press coverage in the history of UCR arts, which was wonderful, right? And this research project began, like I said before, around 2016, early 2017. And discovery of this sample insurance map of showing downtown Riverside. And he says, oops. It's a Korean settlement. The arrow shows a Korean settlement. And like I said before, anywhere, I mean, this An Chang Ho, this Dosan An Chang Ho, He's a very famous man, and there are lots of books and articles written about him, and none of them mention anything about Riverside Korean community. But here it is. Why is it in 1908, Sanborn Insurance Company designated that area as a Korean settlement? So I decided, like I said before, uh, my specialty expertise is LA civil unrest and race relations. And therefore, my research project until 2016 primarily focused on interracial relations, LA, uh, civil unrest, and Korean African American conflicts, whatnot. But I said, maybe I should look into this. Maybe I can write maybe a small article, maybe. And I began research project and with this map in mind, but that was it. There's nothing else. So, you know, I had to start somewhere, right? I began looking into local newspaper and I hit a jackpot, Korean newspaper. Korean newspaper, they were published uh, in 1905 and until 1940s, early 60s. 
it turns out there are lots of information about the Chapa camp and no one look into this because they were only interested in look, uh, looking into those Anchao's activities in San Francisco or Los Angeles. Then uh, Riverside was simply a footnote, right? He came to Riverside to work. That was the extent of record. And I found out in 1908, uh, it was 1532 Pachapa Avenue. By 1930s, the address changed uh, to 4532 Pachapa. And the Pachapa Avenue became Commerce Avenue. And the current address is 3096 Cottage Street. And this is another very important historical photograph. This is a Gage Canal. And the Pachapa Camp was located right next to Gage Canal in Riverside. And this is the members of Korean National Association, which was the main organization at the time in, in the United States. And which shows, this is very important because, oops, it's not working. Because uh, you see a lot of women and, and children. This is highly unusual. I don't, I don't know if you know this, the early Asian American community was known as a bachelor society because women were prohibited from entering in the, in the United States, uh, particularly Chinese women. And so Chinatown was basically a bachelor town. And that's the reason why Chinatown, uh, the prostitution, gambling was widespread because it was 90, 99% of the men were, you know, resident were men. Oh, oh sure. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this is a very important, uh, but the Chapa camp was different. It was a family-based community, which was highly unusual. And I didn't know how this was possible but I found out later on. <laughs> and this is a different, same photograph from different angle. Now, this man taking photo is An Chang Ho. An Chang Ho is a photographer, which is very, uh, and he, An Chang Ho is uh, fourth, sitting in the fourth from the left in this photograph, whereas in this photograph, he's taking photos of the group photo. And An Chang Ho devised a plan to establish a chapter camp in Riverside. And actually, he came to the United States in 1902 with his wife. He just got married, and he decided to come to the United States to be educated and to learn about democracy and Christianity. And he, as, as soon as he landed in San Francisco in October 14, 1902, uh, he couldn't really make a living in San Francisco at the time because San Francisco was in a you know, height of anti-Asian violence, just like what we experienced over the last couple of years. San Francisco was you know, anti-Asian, anti-Chinese, and they were unable to make a living. So he was looking for a place to make a living. And he discovered Riverside was, you know, the weather was much warmer and people were a lot you know, hospitable towards Asian immigrants. And he decided to establish a community known as Pachapa Camp. And he established the Gungni Pyape, meaning Cooperative Association in 1905. And the headquarters was stationed in San Francisco, but members were mostly residing in Riverside. And he devised Hawaii, San Francisco, Riverside plan, which means Korean immigrants who came to Hawaii and they decided to come to San Francisco because Hawaii plantation economy, uh, very low wages, harsh working conditions. The mainland 
it was higher and better working conditions. So Chinese, uh, mostly Japanese and Koreans decided to enter the mainland. And that's the reason why Gentlemen's Agreement of 1907 prohibited uh, Japanese and Koreans who came to Hawaii first, not allowed to land in mainland. That was the Gentlemen's Agreement of 1907. Anyway, before 1907, he as you know, Korean immigrants who were landing in San Francisco, those who came with family, women and children, they were sent to Riverside. Now other young single men, they were sent elsewhere. So he has a plan to establish family-based and democratic society in Riverside, which is you know, highly, highly unusual because remember the Korea was ruled by King until 1910. But here in 1905, he established democratic institution in Riverside, which is a revolutionary idea, right? So he said, physically strong experienced Koreans were to be sent to the Riverside orchards as a sample labor force. They were told to construct their own living quarters as soon as they arrived without asking for any money from Americans. And they were to organize a working team of 10 men and each man on the team was supposed to follow these working guidelines. Our only capital today in this land is nothing but honesty. Therefore work diligently without wasting time whether your employer watches you or not. And then you'll be working not only today but tomorrow and even the whole year round. If your employer has confidence in you, then your friends, Kim Lee Park, will also get jobs and because of your hard and honest work. So that was, you know, they, this was instruction. Uh, those Korean immigrants landed in San Francisco were sent to Riverside, you know, work honest and diligently. And this physical description of the camp itself is like this. We lived in small one-room shack. It was like a shanty town built in 1880s by the Chinese railroad construction workers. The passing of the time made a lumber shrink. The wind blew through the cracks in the walls. No pretense of making it livable. Just four walls, one window, one door, nothing else. We put mud in the cracks to keep the wind out. The water pump, served to several shacks. We had to heat our bath water in a bucket over the open fire outside and then pour it into a tin tub inside. No gas, no electricity. We used the kerosene lamps and one of my chores was to trim the wicks, clean the glass tops and keep the bowls filled with kerosene. So you can see the you know, living condition was very, barely you know, livable. <laughs> No water, no electricity, you know, very, you know, kind of an isolated, segregated camp. And uh, this Pacheca camp existed from 1904 until 1918. Like I said before, the family based women and children and they established a democratic principle and has a Korean labor bureau, meaning uh, the Korean laborers now can get a job. Until An Chang-ho established the Korean Labor Bureau in 1905, labor contracting was monopolized by the Japanese labor contractors. And because of a historical animosity between Japan and Korea, the Japanese labor contractors would not place Korean workers a job. That's just the Korean workers couldn't get a job. That's the reason why he established Korean Labor Bureau. And he also engaged in independence movement here in Riverside and Redlands and other communities. And it was a full, it was not labor camp. It was a community such as a wedding, birthday party and the Korean mission, uh, which was, was part of the uh, Calvary, Riverside Calvary Presbyterian Church. Uh, they were official member of that. And I will be giving the lecture on Calvary, Riverside Calvary Presbyterian Church in November on primarily focusing on Korean mission, a Korean mission. And uh, Henry Valley, I don't know if you, 
know anything about Hamer Valley incident of 1913? Anybody ever heard? The Hamer Valley obviously is in an empire. And this is a very important, historically important uh, event. Uh, it goes like this, you know, 11 workers from the Riverside, the chapter camp was hired by the AP cut farmer in Hemet. So they arrived in Hemet station. That's when more than 200 white laborers were waiting arrival of this Asian, uh, Korean, happened to be Korean workers. And as soon as they land, uh, landed in the, the train station, uh, they, they told them to go back. Otherwise, you know, you, you know, physically harm. So they, they were forced to return back to Riverside. That's when Japanese consulate in San Francisco found out about this and decided to step in, claiming the Koreans in the United States are Japanese subjects. <laughs> Therefore, because Korea is not a colony of Japan in 1910, Korea no longer exists in the international map. That's the why, reason why they are claiming this. And so this, and the embassy, Japanese embassy in Washington DC officially launched a diplomatic campaign to the US government. So it became, this small incident in heaven became international dispute between Japan and the United States. And that's when the Korean National Association in San Francisco sent a telegram to Secretary of the State, William Jennings Bryan, saying, we are not Japanese subjects, we are Korean, uh, so therefore recognized as a Korean. And in order to resolve this international crisis between Japan and the United States, Secretary of the State, William Jennings Bryan, declared Koreans in the United States are not Japanese subjects. Therefore, Japanese government has no jurisdiction over this matter. So case closed. So you know, this is a very, very important historical case for Korean immigrants because now US government with a de facto or you know, semi-officially recognized the Korean immigrants as Koreans, not Japanese subjects. Whereas in Manchuria, elsewhere, no international government would recognize Korea as an independent nation anymore. So which is a very important uh, historical event for the Koreans. And uh, in the beginning of my research project, I thought that the population number in Riverside was about, about 60, but I found out in the Korean newspaper, as of 1905, uh, there were Koreans living in San Francisco 103, Riverside 70. But this number does not include women and children. Therefore, Riverside had more than 100 as of 1905. Two years later, San Francisco 291, Riverside 150. Again, if we include women and children, well over 200. And during the picking season, you know, from December to February, they would, you know, hire temporary workers, more than 100. So the population figure could be over 300 at the height. This is significant because at the time, around 1910, total number of Korean population in mainland was less than 800. So, you know, of that 300 were residing either a chapter camp or residents. They, they went back and forth, which I will explain it to later. And this is a Korean newspaper, Shinan Minbo. Uh, and I, when I found this newspaper, I said, hallelujah. I mean, this is, uh, this is, was a gold mine for me. It says, Riverside is the first Korea town in the United States. It says that. First Korean National Association chapter was established in Riverside. It was uncertain if a Riverside Korean community can maintain, so he was talking about, but he, you know, it confirms that Korea, the Riverside Pachapa camp is the first Korea town. And another, uh, I, I found another one from uh, 
is a, a char. He said, soon became become the first largest Korean settlement in America, at least during the orange season of each year for a number of years. Subsequently, smaller community, Korean communities camps sprung up nearby Redlands, Upland, Claremont, which were offsprings to the main settlement, which was in Riverside. Uh, before many of them began to move to the cities as operators of small shops, restaurants, and grocery stores in Los Angeles and San Francisco, some Eastern cities as they are found today, Lisa um, some Char, the Golden Mountain is an autobiography of uh, Mr. Char. He also corroborated this story. And I went through. And the annual report of the Board of Home Missions of the Presbyterian Church in the United States in 1918 report confirms the Riverside and other happy groups of Christians, somewhat distinguished from other stations about the number of young wives and their children. Again, it makes a note. It's a very unusual uh, community, the women and children. And I went to Riverside Calvary Presbyterian Church, and fortunately, I found this note, Korean membership list. Original. When I discovered this, wow, wow, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, it has more than 50 names. And I saw, I decided to look into stories about uh, Redlands you know, for this lecture. I, I dug up many, more than two stories from Korean newspaper. And Riverside and Redlands Koreans are riding bicycle. And we recently, women are riding bicycle well, according to Kung Yip Shimbo, December 21st, 1905. Korean National Association, Redland chapter, uh, Zhang Bo Chung, uh, he left, and Wong Gil Lee was elected as a new secretary. And uh, they welcomed the new members, Han Pei Kim and Yong Min Cha, uh, according to Kung Yip Shimbo. And Korean National Association uh, Redlands chapter president Jung Sok Cha, and he became in April 7, 1909. But a week later, he became Riverside chapter president. So you can see, you see that they went back and forth from Riverside and Redlands. And he says uh, he established a new school in Korean church in Redlands. And Wung Young Lee's son was born, and, and uh, Lee was a very successful businessman in Redlands in 1910. And he also made a note that the fire destroyed buildings in Redlands, and Riverside chapter members sent $70 to support of him. And Chi Wan Lee purchased a new home in Redlands, and it also shows the address 170 West Sacramento Street. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where that is. Really? They have no Sacramento Street. Really? Well, I, I maybe you should look into this where there is, but uh, you know, I, I don't know the resident area that much. So new resident Korean church, uh, more than 30 members attended in 1910. And they were trying to build a Redlands Korean National Association building, but you know they couldn't uh, raise enough funding, so they returned the money back to headquarters. And major flooding damaged a strawberry farm owned by three Korean farmers, and damaged you know, almost $1,500 in 1912. And uh, Redland labor contractor uh, changed from Kyunghwan Park to Chung Kyung Chen. So those were some of the uh, you know, local history that tied to Redland area. So, you know, obviously there were Korean uh, presence, Korean community in Redlands as well. And this is another very uh, important circle photograph uh, showing An Chang Ho with arrow uh, with a fellow countrymen as well as some white and the Mexican, maybe Spanish workers working in Riverside Orchard. 
And this is a uh, surface chronicle dated uh, December 7, 1902. Remember, An Chao and his wife arrived in October 14, 1902. It turns out they had an interview with the South Pacific Chronicle and full page story about the couple. You notice Korea is not K, but C. And it shows about how Korea was backward. You know, and the Korea was very uncivilized as if but later on in the, in the in the back portion of this interview, uh, he talks about why he came and to learn, educate, and Christianity as well as the democracy. By the way, this is another very interesting photograph taken in 1907 in Riverside. That's his wife, uh, Helen An. To the left is eldest son, Philip An. Does anybody know who he is? I know you know him, who he is. If I tell who he is, you will know. Philip An. He's the first Asian American actor to receive a star in Walk of Fame in Hollywood Broadway. He's most famous from Kung Fu, Blind Master. Oh, you know who he is, right? That's his eldest son. That's his star in Hollywood Boulevard. The north side of the 6200 block of Hollywood. And this is another very important photograph taken in 1911. Oops, sorry. In 1911, they, they had a third Korean National Association uh, North America convention was held in Riverside. And by the way, An Chang Ho, returned to Korea in 1907, uh, left his family members in Rivers. Right? Uh, so he was engaged in independence movement in Korea. But after Korea became colony of Japan in 1910, he returned back to Riverside in September 1911. After he returned, they decided to hold convention in Riverside in November. In this meeting, this is a delegate uh, members, they all came to Riverside to meet with the leader, An Chang Ho. So this is a historically very important photograph. And the reason why I said in the beginning, remember I said, I called it Dosan's Republic. This meeting, they laid the foundation for future of Korea based on principles of democracy, executive branch, judicial, and legislative branch. They laid the 21 articles of governance. In 1911, year after Korea was colonized by Japan, which is a remark, and nobody knew anything about this convention until I discovered it. Not a single historic, historical history books in Korea mention anything about this. Until now, you remember that Korea was ruled by King until 1910. In 1919, nine years later, they established a provisional government in Shanghai, China, and they declared republicanism. How is it possible in nine years, they go from monarchy to republicanism in nine years? And Korean historians said there were no debate, no opposition, nothing. And nobody knows how that was possible. Is that remarkable? Nobody knew. 
and I traced to this. 1911, what they uh, declared and what they uh, passed here in this convention, 21 articles of governance is almost identical. So I trace origins of a Korean democracy to Riverside. I mean, the Korean historians need to come on board. Yeah, <laughs> they haven't done that yet. But I'm making a bold claim that Korean democracy began here. And I have a document to prove it. And until now, nobody, no one was able to trace the origins of a republicanism. Korean National Association, Association was established by the Constitutional Republicanism. The Congress of the Korean National Association shall administer a regional conference on the administrative supervision. Congress of the Korean National Association shall legislate social regulation of the regional conference pass temporary resolutions, level officers, the budget, but the authority will meet once a year, decide many issues based on regulation and execute accordingly. They also established intangible government representing overseas Koreans in 1911. In 1918, unfortunately, the Kachapa camp ceased to exist. Why? Uh, it goes back to 1913. Uh, the Riverside suffered from deep freeze, which wiped out orange growth as a, uh, you know, Orange industry you know, suffered. Many workers began to relocate to Danuba, Willie, Willow, Sacramento, uh, Central California. Uh, by after 1913, there were only about five, six families residing, maintaining, barely maintaining. And finally, in 1918, they said they couldn't maintain it anymore. And uh, they relocated to nearby uh, Vine Street. 1158 Vine Street, which is the end of the Chapa Camp era. Another interesting thing that I found that, I, you know, the suffrage movement here in the United States, women gained voting rights in 1920, right? Korean National Association gave full membership to women two years early, 1918. Can you believe that? 1918. And women were allowed to become full member of Korean National Association, and they have a duty and responsibility equal to that of men. And they became very active in independence movement, which is remarkable. Yes, uh, you know, what they can do is boycott Japanese soy sauce. You know? Products. Yeah. An Chang Ho was a nationalist. The independence movement activism was a production and reproduction of success of the Chapa Camp model community. This was conclusion recently made by a PhD dissertation uh, written by a student who, uh, you know, I gave a lecture in Korea around 2015. And after listening to my lecture, she decided to do a dissertation on this. And that was she, her conclusion about An Chang Ho's legacy. And until now, nobody knew anything about the Chapa camp, but now uh, it, uh, historians are gradually recognizing historical significance of it. Because it all began here, is entire movement. And so I'm the director of the Young Kim Center. By the way, Young Kim is Korean American who led 100th and 442nd Regimental Combat Unit during World War II. So he served, he's, he's the main person who actually responsible for liberation of Rome. And he's also responsible for 
recapturing the town of Pisa, you know, Leaning Tower. And he was told to recapture the town of Pisa, but he didn't want to bomb the city to destroy everything. So he decided to carry out the, the plan, fake attacks, and he was able to recapture the town of Pisa without shooting a single shot. Remarkable Hollywood story. It's true, true story. But anyway, I, I'm very proud of the fact that Young Kim Center is the only Korean American study center in the nation and the only uh, center named after Korean American in the United States. So I'm very happy. And so this will my, end my short presentation and maybe entertain a question and um, Q&A. Thank you so much. Any questions? Yes. Yes. In the picture, the photo of about 1909, you had five women in the front, you covered 35 or 40 men. Were the men waiting for women to come from Korea or did you marry within the society? Uh, ben, he, 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 he's asking one of the photographs, shows about five, six women and children and about 30 men. So his, his main question is, um, are these men waiting for women to arrive from Korea? It depends on. Uh, most of the women you saw there, were, they came as a married couple. But there were a system of picture brides. So the, the exchange of photographs uh, in uh, the, those Korean and Japanese men who sent the photographs to their hometown. Uh, so here in the United States, they're unable to find you know, spouse because of you know, the anti-miscegenation law, which prohibited uh, Asian men from marrying white women or other women. So if you had a mean a cap capital funding to bring your wife from Korea and Japan, you could do so, yes. Because racism. <laughs> Without women, the population cannot grow. So our, you know, you know, United States of America was open door until 1882. Anybody who wants to enter the United States could do so. You know, which is the first immigration law in the United States? Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. We specifically targeted Chinese. Why? Because labor union movement here in California despised the Chinese because many, many times they were often used as strike breakers. So labor union was white only, white men only. But they didn't want Japanese or Chinese to become member of labor union. So they were, so we used to have a, a single party, labor union party, political party in California, which their motto was Chinese must go. Well, we chased the Chinese, but they were aren't they and we chased them out of Redwoods, not exactly the United States. Right, but race bias, yeah. Exactly. 100 years old, is, is the lettering different today than back then? Yeah, a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, I, first of all, it, it, 
What was the first question? <laughs> no, it's about it's about about fifty years. So yeah. Yeah, where 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 did I find the paper? It's online, digitized. Everything is digitized. What was it? It was from Riverside. No, it's from uh, San Francisco. Okay, and how long has it been published? They published uh, almost irregular, but sometimes if they have a funding, they publish every day, or sometimes weekly. Sometimes they shut down for several months because they have no money. And uh, as soon as they have a fundraising, they were able to publish. But it was continuous at, at least. So your study then had to be done on, on the computer. You didn't yeah. have it right there in front of you. Yes, I, the good question is, did that, was I able to comprehend all Korean? Is it written in all Korean? I was able to read, but I couldn't understand what it meant. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a major obstacle. <laughs> but God sent, you know, I don't know how this happened. I mean, it must be a destiny because sometime around 2017 and 2018, two graduate students from Korea University came to my center as a interns. And their major was Korean literature and classic Korean literature. Their major is to interpret all Korean to new Korean. So they translated for me. And without them, I would not have been able to finish the project. But it's a godsend. I mean, I don't know how, how and why they came, but they came to my research center, perfect timing. Worked out, great deal. Any other questions? What kind of what? This is... uh, in the beginning is a labor, right? The only thing they can do is uh, sell their labor, but domestic work for a lot of women. And uh, later on, if you, once they accumulate enough funding capital, they would buy a house or farms, try to you know, become your own farmer. And, but mostly uh, in the beginning, there were uh, domestic workers and laborers, and uh, much later on, they own small mom and pop stores, restaurants. I was uh, curious about the irrigation ditch, or was it the water source, and uh, found the location of where that ditch was, it was all covered over. Yeah, I mean, I found the, the literature that Pachapa Camp was located right next to Gage Canal. So, you know, the photograph confirmed. So I was able to make the link. Was that their water source, irrigation, or both? The Gage Canal was primarily for the orange growth. And the water source was pumped from underground. The Gage Canal is built in 1888 by Matthew Gage. And it starts all the way down by Hospitality Lane. And they used, uh, they used artesian water that came up by just natural pressure out of the uh, Bunker Hill Dyke. And they put it into the canal, and the canal goes all the way up through Loma Linda and then up to Grand Terrace. In fact, you can see it if you take the old road along the side of 215, you'll see it along the side of the terrace, and it goes by gravity flow all the way to Riverside and irrigated all of Riverside. And essentially, it's the water beat surplus water that San Bernardino said we got to get rid of all this swamp area. Because all of that is now the Inland Center and everything down towards the 215 across all Hospitality Lane was Urbita Springs and a swamp. And so in order to drain that off, they lowered the water table by allowing the water to be pumped to, uh, to Riverside. Actually not pumped. It is pumped now. And if you go down on Hospitality Lane and you follow along the edge of the Santa Ana River, You'll see the pump houses there, 
and then pumping to Riverside. So Riverside wants to see keep us um, keeping the percolation ponds filled because then they don't have to pump from as deep. And uh, San Bernardino doesn't want the percolation too high because it floods in the center and we get springs coming up at uh, what we used to be May Company and the parking lots there, everything. Uh, but the water table is about 15 feet down. So uh, none of the buildings on Hospitality Lane have uh, basements. If they did, they could raise fish, <laughs> okay? Uh, because the water table is that high and just seep in. So it's quite, it's quite good. So we're on top of 6 million acre feet of water uh, in the San Diego Valley from the 215 freeway and the 10 interchange all the way back to the Crafton Hills. We're 550,000 uh, acre feet low. And to give you an example of that, that's seven Big Bear Lakes full that we have uh, taken out since the droughts have been, and we haven't been able to percolate as much underground water as, as we need. So uh, we still have an abundance of water. There's one place that sure like to suck in with big straws to our underground basin. It's called Los Angeles. <laughs> Well, uh, tonight um, is a perfect example of what one person can do to research an uh, important chapter in our history. It kind of follows our um, last year, we did an ethnic program and, and study for um, the uh, Black and, and uh, other ethnic groups in Redlands to really uh, tell the entire story of Redlands. In our Sanborn maps, um, a couple of the years, they do show a Korean settlement, uh, but like Tom said, not a mention of it in the newspaper. So this is a, a great example of what uh, we all can do in our research and effort. I'd like to thank Professor Chang for coming tonight. It's wonderful. Thank you. Well, Thomas Jackson, our hospitality person, has all kinds of goodies back here on the table that he doesn't want to take home, but he wants you to stay here and eat them. And then we now in January 1st, if you re-up for the Historical Society for your dues for next year, it's $30 until January 1. And January 1, it's 35. So be my guest, they can take PayPal, checks, and cash. Cash, Venmo, PayPal, and checks. So Professor Chang brought some of his books. If you're interested in purchasing them, he's got some copies. How much is the book? Okay. Thank you guys for attending. Thank you. Stop sharing. End. Yeah, I got it. <laughs>